<laughs> so I expect it to be excellent now that you have an extra week. It'll be spectacular. It'll be broadcast quality. Okay. Uh, any objections to the extension? No? Because you're free to submit it earlier. All right. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the big diseases. When we first started doing this course, um, it's all theory. The theory is in the title, after all. And then someone says, yeah, but I don't, under I don't know anything about the actual diseases, which I thought was something that health sciences gives us automatically. I guess not. So we throw in this um, additional lecture to give us a thorough understanding of the big plagues of the world. Because if you're going to talk about global health, you should be able to speak somewhat authoritatively about the big guys. So uh, I don't know why I have this slide here. Uh, it's been there for a few years. I always forget because I think the first time I taught this lecture many years ago, I was going to a food drive, and um, I took out of my parent's shelf this... No, no, it wasn't my parent's shelf. This came out of... Uh, we're going through food, donated a food drive, and this bottle of peanut butter was in there. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a thing called Peter Pan peanut butter. This is back in the 70s. And uh, unsurprisingly, this jar of peanut butter that we found in the food drive donation, like two years ago was from 1979. So uh, was it still good? Eh, it tasted fine to me. So, <laughs> so speaking of things that taste fine, no, I'm kidding. What is, uh, like that one? <laughs> what is this? Obviously, you know what it is because it's in the slide. This is smallpox. And why is smallpox so special in the annals of health sciences? Yes? It's an eradicate, exactly. And it gave us the example of how to eradicate diseases. So we started thinking, well, if we can eradicate smallpox, why can't we eradicate some other stuff that bugs us so badly? So we'll talk a bit about uh, eradication and why we care about it and why we can't do it in, in, in some cases. So um, as I think I've mentioned before, the global eradication of smallpox was accomplished in the late 70s, early 80s as a result of uh, somewhat heroic measures by a team of young epidemiologists. And um, one of the videos you'll be watching in a couple of weeks for that class that I'm not here for, for which you've got to watch a video, is about the eradication of smallpox and uh, um, the heroic endeavors by a handful of individuals. This is uh, an image of the last person known to have naturally occurring smallpox, a Bangladeshi girl who recovered. She was fine. Um, I think I mentioned in other classes that a few years later, uh, an unnatural case of smallpox resulted when there was improperly stored test samples in a lab, and one of the lab techs, I think it's a lab tech, died of an infection. But that was unnatural. This was the last natural case. Um, and I mentioned, I think, in the epi class, this quote, which is important to me because it's from 1806, Thomas Jefferson, U.S. President, to Edward Jenner, the first person to create a working... Uh, variolation-based vaccine for smallpox. And he says, you've erased from the calendar of human afflictions one of its greatest. Yours is a counter reflection that mankind can never forget that you have lived. Future nations will know by history only the low smug. So the point of this quote is that Thomas Jefferson, like everyone else at the time, assumed that because of this variolation, smallpox was going to be eradicated in 1806. But it took another 180 years to do so. So clearly eradication is not as simple as simply having a vaccination, or in this case, a variolation. Anyone know the difference between a variolation and vaccination? What's the purpose of health sciences education? I just don't know anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I see a hand fluttering. Yeah, yeah. Um, like the variolation is when you switch it to superficial layers of the skin using a non. Yeah. Non uh, that's about it, right? So it's, it's a direct uh, application of a living thing. Um, in this case, it was scabs from cowpox or smallpox victims on open wounds. So people, as a high, high fatality rate, people actually died of it a lot, but if you didn't die of it, chances are you're immune to smallpox. But we were able to eradicate smallpox due to a number of factors. First is that there is no natural reservoir except for humans. What's a natural reservoir for a disease? Anybody know? Again, what do they teach us in health sciences? Yeah, back there. Um, Not a vector is different from a reservoir. What's a reservoir? It's where the animal or the, or the infection lives naturally. So in the case of bubonic plague, we think the natural reservoir was in some kind of small mammal, rat-like mammal. In the case of Ebola, similar, probably some small rodent type thing. But in the case of smallpox, it's humans. So why is it important that the reservoir be humans if we're eradicating it? Because 
That's right. If it's going to retreat to some population of unknown rodents living under a swamp somewhere, we're never going to eradicate it. If we know it's the humans only, well, then we just attack all the humans because we know more or less where the humans are. But not every uh, disease has a natural reservoir that's just humans. In fact, most don't. Nearly all persons infected have a characteristic rash and infectious for a short period. Why is that important? Why is it important to be able to see an infection if we're going to eradicate it? If I can't see it, do I know you have it? Obviously not. So having something that's visible allows us to tell, oh, you've got the disease, therefore I know I either don't need to vaccinate you or it's too late for you, whatever my, my case might be. So some obvious symbol or indication of infection is important. Natural infection conferred lifelong immunity. What does that mean? It means that if you get the disease, you're not going to get it again. Why is that important if we're trying to eradicate? Why can't we eradicate the flu or the common cold? Yeah. Mutates, more or less. So if you get it this year, you're going to get it again next year. Doesn't, the immunity from this year does not tra travel over into next year. So this way, if it's lifelong immunity, I can make you immune now and never have to vaccinate you again. That's why it works. If that doesn't work, then we can't eradicate. Last is a safe, effective, inexpensive vaccine. So this, the last part is the technology. That's what we as human beings were able to create. The rest were natural characteristics of the disease. So we need at least these four things in order to eradicate an infectious disease. Also, we're able to eradicate globally because of this thing called herd immunity, which I've talked about a number of times. And I'll say it again, herd immunity is the idea that if you are at the center of the herd, you don't need to be as immune as the people at the periphery of the herd because you are unlikely to encounter anybody outside of the herd. How that works for people is that we don't have to uh, immunize everybody, just a certain proportion. Because in this class, probably one of you didn't get your vaccines because your parents are hippie freaks, right? I'm not saying which one of you it is. I think it's a partner, but um, just <laughs> one of you probably is. But you're l less likely to be uh, confronted with uh, diseases because the rest of us have been vaccinated. So we're the buffer against other people being um, infectious. So the magic of herd immunity allows us to avoid having to vaccinate everybody, just a certain proportion. So in the 80s, um, there was a task force that was set up to determine which diseases we can eradicate. And this was uh, hosted at the Carter Center, in Virginia Carter, and they um, uh, concluded that seven diseases were likely <laughs> candidates for eradication. And um, several of these have since fallen off of our targets for eradication due to failures of attempts, but some have remained, and, and a couple of them are close. Polio and guinea worm are, are kind of close. Previously on the list were these guys. These were the big guys, TB, leprosy, rabies, right? And we've kind of given up because we've determined, you know, it's, it's um, the, all four of those characteristics may not apply, uh, the mutation rates are too high, or it's just too daunting of a logistical task. Polio eradication is still underway, and we're putting a lot of effort into it. A lot of uh, big guns are trained at it, the uh, Gates Foundation, for example. And um, we thought we were on the right path in the early 20th century when uh, a vaccine was rolled out and we found uh, um, high success with it. We had some cases reassert themselves in the 80s that gave uh, some pause. But now that there's a new oral vaccine, um, distribution to the developing world has been much easier. So there's a, a couple of about three countries still in the world that are thought to be polio endemic. Um, I'll show what they are in a second. And we can start to think about why they're endemic. And the reasons are more human and less technological. So uh, this is the last person in India to have had polio. So we think India is now polio free in 2014. That was a big accomplishment because India, of course, is a large country full of uh, poverty and a lot of children. And it's difficult to get to everybody. But in 2014, we officially declared India polio free. And these in, uh, um, places are where polio is still hanging around. So it's endemic in these three countries, but there's still a few cases smattering in the yellow ones as well. Unsurprisingly, you probably see some correlations here between presence of this disease and other development indicators like uh, poverty, like climate change susceptibility, etc. So these are the countries that are still struggling. Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. And you start to see, hopefully, uh, some common characteristics to these countries. Uh, they are, they probably have some degree of insecurity, particularly Afghanistan and Pakistan. There's a weak healthcare system. 
and hygiene is a challenge. So at a development level, we can attack this disease through infrastructure. We strengthen these things relatively easily. These are, these are political choices. And then the technology can inter intercede and we can use the uh, vaccine accordingly. Uh, anyone know what rinderpest is? Heard of rinderpest before? It's a agricultural or veterinary disease that affects cattle. We think that rinderpest actually is the origins of measles. And uh, human measles evolved from rinderpest sometime in the 12th century. Um, but there's been a global attempt to eradicate rinderpest, and we think we kind of got it eradicated around 2001. So we talk about disease eradication. Oftentimes, we are not including veterinary diseases into our MISC, zoonotic diseases. We're usually talking about, about human diseases. We recognize that we do have a lot of experience attacking diseases that are strictly agricultural as well. And it's a good thing because, as I'm hoping you're starting to appreciate, there's a, a large overlap between zoonotic diseases, animal disease, veterinary diseases, and human diseases. We are, after all, animals. All right. So I mentioned that guinea worm, or draculocytosis, I can't pronounce it, dracu something or other, is one of these diseases that um, is targeted for eradication. Does anyone know anything about guinea worm? How we get it, where it comes from? Ever seen a case, anybody? Yeah, tell me about it. What do you know about it? I don't know anything, but I've seen it. You've seen it in real life? What does it look like? No, ringworm is a fungus, but it is a, wor a ring and it's a worm, so you may be confusing the two. It looks like that? Okay, the way it works is um, you get it from drinking contaminated water that has uh, spores in it. And um, these spores uh, uh, sort of hatch in your body, and the, um, the two sexes of worms travel through your tissue and meet each other and mate. The males die, and the females start migrating to your skin. And their goal is for when you submerge yourself in water, it's going to spray more spores into the water. So that's the guinea worm life cycle. It actually uses your body to gestate its young. And then when you're in contact with water, that's how it spreads it. And the way you get rid of it is when it gets to the surface of your skin, you kind of tie a stick around it and you make a turn every day, a little turn. If you pull that all at once, it'll break and give you an infection and possibly kill you. Probably not, but it'll just make you sick. So instead, I've been to countries where it's not uncommon to see people walking around with sticks of worms on the sides of their bodies. Most typically, it's the hands and the scrotum good times, right? <laughs> so any place where the, uh, the skin is, is, is thin. So, uh, um, so we want to get rid of guinea worm for obvious reasons. It's not a fatal disease, but it's not fun. Right? It does cause some, some challenges. And um, it's uh, endemic in these countries here. Again, countries you probably recognize as having hygiene, infrastructure, and health system challenges. That's the recurring theme here. Filariasis also called Bigfoot or Godi or things like that. It's common in a few countries as well, and it's, it's, it's a parasite that um, uh, has a, a mosquito vector. And um, it, it's easily avoided through hygiene measures and from uh, mosquito control, and also through a drug called uh, DEC, D-E-C, and I forget what DEC stands for. So one country I was working in, there's a big campaign to inject DEC into um, salt. And so people were encouraged to buy the deck salt to prevent spread of filariasis. Problem is deck salt is slightly more expensive. So you need a lot of social marketing to convince people to spend a few more pennies to buy deck salt. So this is a Caribbean country. And so uh, the government rolled out this really catchy reggae tune to buy deck salt. I'd sing it for you, but I don't want to. Um, if I could find the commercial, I'd play it for you there too. I don't know if the deck salt campaign worked. Because um, in my experience, convincing people to buy a more expensive product is very difficult unless you really sell the science or build it into the culture rigid, rigid, rigidly, and I think they failed to do so. But um, there are other ways of controlling it through infrastructure, mosquito control, etc. But essentially, it causes extreme lymph infection, and so large parts of your body, like the feet, the hands, again, the scrotum uh, gets quite large. I mean, I can show you pictures of men with their scrotum actually in a wheelbarrow walking around. Uh, good times. All right. This is cystichercosis. I'm probably mispronouncing that as well. Also called the pork tapeworm. This is a worm that lives in your gut and can also migrate to your brain. In fact, it's one of the most common causes of seizures in the developing world. And uh, as you might um, 
already figured out that as a tapeworm, you get it from eating uh, contaminated pork or pork-like products, or again, from just being in, in drinking water that has been contaminated with the, uh, the larvae. Um, and it lives in uh, your body and does all these fun things. So we can get rid of this with a vaccine as well and with certain kinds of drugs. So you can go to this link, I think this link still works, to look at diseases that we think can still be eradicated. But some of the challenges to eradicating these diseases, in addition to those four characteristics I talked about, often we don't know where the diseases are. The countries I listed, Chad, South Sudan, they have such infrastructure challenges that the, the surveillance data is very, very poor. Also, oftentimes, they're difficult to diagnose. With smallpox, you had that very telltale rash. With uh, ringworm, or sorry, guinea worm, you've got the ring-shaped worm and the thing hanging out the side. Um, with tapeworm, it's kind of difficult unless you do a stool sample test, right? So sometimes you can't tell if someone has it. Sometimes there isn't an effective vaccine or an appropriate vaccine for a certain demographic, like children most commonly. Or we have this inexhaustible environmental reservoir, tetanus. Where does tetanus live? Anybody know? How do you get tetanus? You've all got tetanus shots in the back? Okay, so that's, that's a bit of a myth, is that we're told it's from the rusty nail. It's not from the rusty nail from the soil. So the rusty nail opens up the flesh so that the the um, organism from the soil gets in. So tetanus lives in soil, that's right. So we can't go and treat all the soil in the world. So tetanus will probably never be uh, eradicated. Or more commonly, in my opinion, the primary healthcare system is so incredibly weak, we cannot roll out the vaccines or roll out the diagnostic process or roll out the prevention program. When we talk about eradication, one disease always comes up, and it is malaria. So um, we often talk about uh, the great plague of our time being HIV AIDS, and in many ways it is, but in my opinion, it's always been malaria. Malaria shuts down entire economies. Malaria probably changed human history. Um, everyone here has probably has some access or exposure to malaria, either indirectly or directly. And as I mentioned a couple of times, Ottawa used to be an endemic auto, uh, malaria zone, as has Washington, D.C., in fact, many of the major cities of the world were once uh, endemic with malaria. It kills a lot of people. So I'm fond of saying every 30 seconds a child dies of malaria. It affects half a billion people a year. It is largely preventable because it, as you know, it is, uh, uh, the vector is, is mosquitoes. We can control mosquitoes, we can control malaria. And it is somewhat treatable. Some strains are treatable as we're about to see, not all of them. Most of the cases in the world occur in sub-Saharan Africa. And as a recurring theme in this course, everything happens in sub-Saharan Africa. So they, have, they get the worst shit out of every shit in the world. And that's also where poverty is the biggest problem. So you'll see this overlap between malaria and poverty. And the question is, does one cause the other or does the other cause the one? And the answer is both. So it's a big problem and it's not going away anytime soon. As I mentioned, it used to be big in Ottawa. So uh, we called it Agwe here. And it was particularly big when the canal was being built. It's un unclear whether workers were being brought here already had it or they got it while they were here because there were swamp-like um, zones. Probably, probably both. But if you look around this region, you'll see a lot of monuments to malaria victims. There's one right at the head of the canal, right by the Chateau Laurier. If you go down to the bottom where the water is, you'll see a cross, a Celtic cross, and has images for the things that killed the canal workers. One is the, the or things that are descriptive of the canal workers. One is the Celtic cross, the Celtic harp rather, because all the workers are Irish. Another was uh, dynamite. And another is the mosquito. There's a giant mosquito on this cross. And um, have a look one day, it's interesting. If you go to Leeds and Grenville, you'll see this massive cemetery, which is dedicated mostly to people who died of malaria along the canal. And as I'm fond of saying as well, pretty much everything north of Lisgar Street in Elgin is a giant cemetery uh, unmarked graves for the uh, canal workers who died of malaria poisoning, malaria uh, uh, infection. So he, these are the countries in um, yellow where there is some risk of malaria. Um, this is changing. Why is it changing? What global phenomenon is changing where malaria exists? Yes, madam? Exactly, climate change. That's changing everything. And we'll talk more about this, I believe, um, uh, next week, or this week possibly, and next week we talk about climate change. This is where the cases are. This is where the density of the parasite is, the plasmodium parasite. 
So the more red, the more dense the parasite. Unsurprisingly, they're in sub-Saharan Africa. So there are actually four, at least four types of malaria. Actually, more than that. There are some types that exist in primates, non-human primates as well. But um, most commonly are the top two. So when we talk about malaria, we're talking about these two here. And um, this is the one that kills everybody, and this is the one that everyone gets. So if you get this one, you're in really dire straits. If you get Vivax, you probably recover, but that's what's costing all the money. So again, there's a, there's a few other uh, species. One of them is Nolesi, which is mostly in macaques. So as I mentioned, falciparum is the deadliest. Depending on the data source, it accounts for at least half, uh, if not the majority, of all human malaria infections and almost all of the deaths. But you mostly get Vivax. And, you know, I've had a lot of uh, friends and coworkers who've had many cases of Vivax, uh, and it, it recurs a lot. So um, what it does, it, it can affect brain function and long-term health. It definitely affects productivity. So if you have a, an endemic zone of Vivax, you're going to have a lot of workers who can't work. And that affects economic productivity. It affects the livelihood within the household. It affects happiness and prosperity overall. So, as I mentioned, um, the places where uh, malaria is most common is also the places in the world that are most impoverished. So the question is, does poverty cause malaria or does malaria cause poverty? And I'll suggest to you that it is iterative. Both seem to happen. Here's an example. So the lowest income group in Malawi spends 32% of their income on fighting malaria, but the top income group only spends 4%. So if both groups get malaria, the lowest income group is going to be hardest hit because they're spending a larger proportion of their income on dealing with it. So even though you may argue that human beings have the same metabolism and physiology, your ability to deal with that infection is gated by your wealth. Um, we think that the economic impact on Africa alone is at least $12 billion per year. How? Well, obviously, direct costs having to do with treating these individuals. Um, I mentioned productivity. So a big problem is days of lost work, especially in places that are, are, are labor intensive, and days lost in education. So if your kids can't go to school, there will be a long-term drain on the system. And interestingly, some people suggest that because malaria can affect your brain, lost productivity overall due to a decreased national level of brain damage. Fascinating. Um, so, we think in some countries, malaria eats up 40% of public health resources, 40%, and accounts for half of hospital activity. Now, when we talk about HIV AIDS, this gets really complicated because HIV also will eat up uh, almost uh, all of a nation's public health uh, resources. So, two, if two diseases are eating up everything, that doesn't leave a lot for everything else. Okay. Yeah, lost tourism. Okay. Uh, skip that stuff. All right. Again, chicken egg, yeah, which came first? I get it. Cool. All right. Um, is it the poverty that comes first or is it the disease that comes first? And I will suggest to you that it's both. How do we treat it? My favorite drink. What's my favorite? We have this conversation in other classes. Apparently, what's my favorite drink? You, you've bought me this drink. No, you haven't? No? Okay, fine. We, we, you will one day. Yes, sir. <laughs> Limca. No, not Limca. Alcoholic drink. I'm an adult. Come on. <laughs> It's the global health drink. What's the global health drink? No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not tequila. No. It's a gin and tonic. Why do you think it's a gin and tonic? I'll give a hint. The gin and tonic was invented in India during the British occupation when the Raj was in power. People are writing down gin and tonic. If I can, I'm going to test you on my favorite drink. Come on. <laughs> it's because gin, of course, is you know, a really good drink. But the tonic is made of quinine. And the gin and tonic was invented as a way for British soldiers to get their dosage of quinine because quinine is a prophylaxis against malaria. Now, you know, back 200 years ago, it was a fairly powerful prophylaxis. Blah, 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 prophylaxis. These days, due to increased resistance, it's not as powerful, but that doesn't prevent me from drinking it. So um, we have a host of anti-malarial drugs, most of them based on you know, quinine. Um, and yet we have this problem with increasing resistance around the world. So chloroquine is the cheapest and most used of the prophylaxis drugs. Uh, it costs pennies now, but it's so common that chloroquine resistance is quite uh, endemic around the world. But now we have other kinds of 
resistant spreading as well. As a result, or probably as a cause, we have a problem with counterfeit drugs. This is one of these global health topics that you may want to pursue in your projects or in your life or whatever, because you're looking for market solutions or policy solutions for this really important problem. Companies create counterfeit drugs. Why? Because people buy them and they make money off them. The actual drugs are expensive. So there's a drug called um, artisanin. I can't pronounce it. So artisanin-based malaria medications are the gold standard for malaria now. There's one plant grown mostly in China that has a really good uh, success rate in treating malaria. Now, we now grow it elsewhere, but as a result, a handful of companies make it and ship it around, and it costs uh, some amounts of money. If you go to a pharmacy in Cambodia or Indonesia or any place in Southeast Asia, it's hard to tell which of these drugs is real. They've got the right packaging, they have the right labels on it, the pills look the same, but some of them have nothing in it because evil people are making counterfeit drugs. Some of the solutions have been proposed are like, uh, well, we have a hologram now, so the counterfeiters can't create this hologram. Two months later, the counterfeiters have a hologram. So there's a bit of a, an arms race over how to address the problem with counterfeit drugs. And the counterfeiting occurs in different stages. It can be at the point of sale, the pharmacists are corrupt. It can be the transportation stage, the transport company is corrupt. It can be at the um, at the uh, uh, production phase. We don't know. And I have no solutions, but be aware that this is a global issue. All right. So um, I have this video called Dealers in Death um, that I've illegally placed on my website here. You can download it. I think it's still there. If not, let me know. And uh, it's a short documentary on the prevalence of counterfeit drugs. Um, the irony, of course, is I'm streaming it from a copyright illegal website. So illegal drugs, illegal web, no? Nobody sees the irony? Nobody? All right, fine. Okay. This is where drug resistance is common. Um, chloroquine is the most common drug. That's the triangles. That's everywhere. Uh, pyrimethane, second most common. That's circles. And mefloquine is what you would get now if you go to your doctor and tell him you're traveling to an endemic area. You probably get mefloquine. Um, uh, there's another drug. Larium. Larium is fun. Larium like, gives you psychotic dreams. I used to pop larium for fun back in the day. You get these like really wacky dreams, and well, not entirely for fun. So go to, you go to India and you look forward to taking a larium, because I know I'm going to have a good time tonight. All right. <laughs> they don't give larium anymore, and now it's all uh, other stuff. So um, as I mentioned, the artimicin, artimicin in dr uh, drugs are the gold standard now. And prevention is always key. So. Mosquito control is important, getting rid of the mosquitoes, getting rid of standing water, treating people not to live near standing water, etc., avoiding mosquitoes, etc., 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 particularly avoiding them in the dawn and the dusk. That's when the malaria-bearing mosquitoes are most active. Now, bed nets are an easy, low-tech, effective way of avoiding being bitten, especially in the morning and the evening. And we particularly recommend that children use them because the children are the most susceptible to having brain damage issues if they get malaria. So we have all kinds of programs around the world giving out bed nets to families, but they are not used appropriately. First of all, the children tend not to use them. Who tends to use them? <coughs> if not the kids in the family, who's going to use them? Yes? The breadwinner, exactly. And you can say, oh, that's horrible, that's sexist, it's the, the man of the family. Well, it makes sense at a certain economic level. So if, if the man of the family, who is usually the breadwinner, can't get up and go to work, the family will starve. So it makes sense for them to dedicate their disease prevention resources towards him. Okay, so it may offend us, but that's, they've done that math in their heads. Second of all, sometimes people use them as fish, fishing nets. Um, I've never seen this, but I've heard it done. Right? And you say, oh, that's horrible. At the same time, what's more important uh, to them? Avoiding getting bitten by a mosquito or making sure your family is fed that day. There are all kinds of strategies as well for distributing bed nets. For a while, it was popular to charge people for them, like a modicum fee, like a, a dollar or a few pennies, something that wouldn't bankrupt them, but would confer a value upon it. Can you see the, the rationale? Can you explain it to me? What's the rationale behind making poor people pay for a thing that we can afford? It's an economic argument. I'll, I'll say it again. So instead of just giving out the bed nets, for a while we were making people paying a few pennies for them. 
Yeah. Maybe if they pay for them, they're more likely to use them for their intended purpose. Exactly right. So if you pay for something, you're going to value it more, goes the rationale. The pushback, of course, is that you shouldn't make people pay for things that you know we're giving out for free and that really the payment is symbolic for. So right now, I believe the... Um, the trend is not making people pay for it, but these things are cyclical. And I'm sure the pendulum will swing again and we'll go back to making people pay for things again. But be aware that you can buy bed nets. And if you're traveling to uh, endemic areas, I recommend you buy your own bed net. They're really cheap these days. You can go here and buy a net for other countries if you want. So um, climate change, as mentioned, is one of the great confounders that we can't predict right now. So right now, we think these yellow areas are where malaria is and the red areas is where they will be in addition by 2050. So it's migrating outside of the temperate band. And that's just a projection. Who knows where it'll be? So that's terrifying. What is this? This is dun, 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 tuberculosis, which is a bacterium. Hopefully your health sciences education allows you to identify these as bacteria. So tuberculosis is one of our oldest compatriots on this planet, and it ain't going away anytime soon. So um, we think we got it from cattle 10,000 years ago. However, there's evidence that Homo erectus had it almost uh, uh, anywhere from four million to half a million years ago. Yes, you can you can snicker at Homo erectus. It's a funny word. And you can read about um, you know uh, finding evidence of Homo erectus TB infection in this New York Times article if you like. So it's been with us for a long time. The frightening thing is that maybe a third of people on the planet, a third, have TB at any given time. Probably somebody in this room has TB. It's a partner, probably. Yeah. So um, most of us, if we have TB, it's it's non-infectious. It's it's what's the word I'm looking for? It's um, eh, in remission or something like that. Right? I can't think of the word right now. Um, but maybe eight to nine million a year become ill from their. TB that's already in their bodies, and 2 million die per year. Now, this was kind of in the background of global health for a long time until HIV came along. And HIV really accelerated the importance of TB in the global discourse between, because TB is the biggest killer of people with AIDS. AIDS, because it damages your immune system, allows TB to assert itself in a powerful way. So the thing that kills people with HIV AIDS isn't the AIDS itself, of course, it's the opportunistic infections of which TB is one of the most potent ones. So this is where TB is most incident. I mentioned that you know, Sub-Saharan Africa tends to struggle the most, most diseases, but look over here. Russia and former Soviet republics are like really have bad TB problems. And you know, TB, um, because we get it from breathing the same air together, can be exacerbated by crowding. So prisons are particularly problematic areas um, or places with a lot of people living under one roof. Uh, I did a, a project once in a jungle prison. That was fantastic. So the, this, this, this prison is deep in the middle of the jungle. It's gloriously beautiful. You gotta take uh, boats out there and you get to this isolated rock which is surrounded by rivers and you overlook this magnificent rainforest plateau and there are about uh, 100 prisoners there, um, minimum security prison. And um, a member of my team was a, a Miss Universe candidate actually. So we were very popular because you brought a Miss Universe candidate to a jungle prison. Um, and when we got there, there had been a case of, of TB. One guy had had TB and had died. And the entire prison population was up in arms and terrified and like screaming, get us out of here, get us out of here. Um, so we had to calm them down. And there's not a whole lot we could do because that particular community and, and government is not prepared to evacuate an entire prison. And probably it wasn't a serious case and they're probably fine. However, I can certainly understand the terror. I got a little scared too, right? Because you're stuck really in the middle of nowhere and if you get TB, eh, ain't nothing gonna happen for you, right? So um, people in these areas are, are readily aware of the challenges and the threat posed by tuberculosis, and it is a growing issue. Um, Canada maintains a very strong TB surveillance system. We're actually quite proud of our system. So we have a pretty solid idea of how um, prevalent TB is in this country. Yes? Can you tell us what um, the outcome? Oh, that particular case? Yeah. Oh, well, the guy died. Like, he died before he got there. Yeah. 
I don't know, I didn't stick around long to find out. <laughs> Our mission was simply to diagnose certain cases, give treatment of what we found, and then move on, right? So we spent like just a couple of days there. Um, there may have been cases afterwards. I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't hear about any. I'll tell you, though, that particular population, as I've seen in, in other um, developing world prisons, the biggest issue, the biggest issue um, that I'm finding in the developing world that is unaddressed by most global health programs is back pain. Is that amazing? So what they seem to want isn't more doctors visiting or more epidemiologists. They want physiotherapists showing up and telling them how to crouch correctly, how to grate their coconuts with appropriate posture, what exercises to do to fix their back pain. I get currency out of ibuprofen. I bribe my way into uh, into buildings by handing out ibuprofen because <laughs> pain, pain's everything. Yes. Russia doesn't have a big population? Right. Um, it's a good point. But where they do have it, it's, it's tightly clustered. So uh, I don't know for sure. I'm theorizing that in, in the extreme cold parts of Russia, people are living in small communities close together. I don't know for sure. The data could be poor. But the data we do have suggests that. Or it could be just a failure of their system to care about it. It's also a, a poverty issue. Pr parts of Russia are really quite impoverished. Okay. Okay, moving on. So as a result of tuberculosis, we have this program called DOTS. And I mentioned before, it stands for Directly Obser Observed Therapy Short Course. And DOTS, look, it looks like this. It's like, um, this is one of our DOTS workers in Guyana, actually. So your, your tax dollars paid for this motorcycle and for her kit and for her uniform and for her to go out to find a TB case in the middle of the... Uh, or the forest, wherever this guy's living, brings him a little bit of food, uh, the drugs that he takes, watches him take it, comes back, the next day, same thing, goes out, finds him, gives him some food, gives him some drugs. Why do we have dots? Why is it important that we pay for someone to take the drugs to this person and make sure they take it? Yes? Exactly. Drug resistance, which is probably the biggest problem in global health at the moment. We can talk more about drug resistance if you want. So um, DOTS exists as a way to curtail, to curtail um, uh, potential resistance. Does it work? Well, that's debatable. Different studies suggest different things, but that's what the best we have, and it is the WHO mandated or recommended strategy for addressing TB in any community. We have these things called MDR-TB and XDR-TB. So MDR is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And this is where um, if you are resistant to f two of the first line TB drugs, and M XDR is if you are resistant to three or more of the second line drugs. So um, we saw M MDR a few years ago, people got scared, and XDR pops up and now we're terrified. So in the USA, 4% of MDR cases are actually XDR. Um, we don't know how prevalent it is in other parts of the world. It's popping up in, in South America and in, in Russia, I've heard it as well. Um, so who knows where this is going to go? You should be, you should be a little scared, I think. Uh, XDR is a scary endeavor. Some people claim it doesn't exist, that we just have MDR cases, and these are just you know outliers. Um, I'll tell you a, a story when you do the ethics lecture of how one country refused to acknowledge the existence of MDR. And that created a bit of an ethical crisis. But that is an emerging issue. So this is the percent of TB cases that are MDR around the world. So we have the yellow are the most common. Russia, again, has most commonly MDR cases. <coughs> so uh, TB has been with us a very long time. So we know a lot about it, and we know that it affects economics quite profoundly. So here's one study that suggests that there's an annual loss of up to $2 billion worldwide due to tuberculosis alone. And as we, as we mentioned, that can be caused by loss of productivity, loss of tourism, etc. So we think the three great diseases of poverty are tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV AIDS. So these are the ones that are associated with poverty. If you're impoverished, you're likely to experience these more. If you experience these more, you're likely to become impoverished. So there's that chicken-egg relationship. As a result, the Global Fund was created to tackle specifically HIV, malaria, and TB um, issues. And the Global Fund was created as a result of an article published by Jeff Sachs. I mentioned Jeff Sachs before. He is one of the great global thinkers around the world. And Amir Adaran, who's a professor here, University of Ottawa. And um, 
their rationale was, we are going to give a lot of money to fight these diseases and that this money would be um, tied to outcomes. It would be evaluable. There would be indicators attached to it. Amir has since turned around and is highly critical of the Global Fund because he claims a lot of the decisions made by the Global Fund practitioners now are not evidence-based. Oftentimes, there isn't um, baseline data to determine if we're actually showing improvement or not. So he's one of the great critics of it. Um, I was with him recently. We got a call from the Trump White House asking him to consult, we think, it was going to be on uh, uh, attacking the Global Fund. And, of course, he rolls his eyes because, you know, who wants to work for the Trump White House? But it's, it's kind of funny that they're just looking for reasons to defund every program, including the Global Fund. So, um, the Global Fund is one of the great sources of money for these kinds of programs, too. So, let's talk about HIV-AIDS now, uh, the great plague of our time, supposedly. This is where, in Africa, we think it is the most common. The darker areas are so worse. So, Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho are the most commonly uh, affected places. They swap every year in terms of who's got the biggest burden. So we talk about HIV AIDS around the world, we're usually talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. The vast majority of cases are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the cases there are not like the cases in the rest of the world, as we will see, demographically. So hopefully you all know the basics already. HIV sta or AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Um, when I was a student, people couldn't even remember that. They're calling it autoimmune disease disorder. Um, sometimes it was called GRID the gay-related immune deficiency. Back in the 80s, it was the gay cancer because it was mostly homosexual men getting it. Um, when I was a graduate student, one of our first professors uh, was telling her medical students at the time, don't worry about this AIDS thing. It's like this immediate thing is going to go away in a few weeks. Don't worry about it. Uh, she was wrong. Um, she died before she knew she was wrong. So maybe that's you know good and bad, but I'm not so sure. Um, there is, we think that the current pandemic started in the 70s. There is some evidence suggests that patient zero was a French-Canadian flight attendant. That's unclear. However, there is tissue evidence suggests that the virus has been with us for 100 years or so. So it could be longer than that. Who knows? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it came from. What matters is we have it now. And we know it's transmitted via sharing of fluids. So sex, needles, blood transfusions, all that fun stuff. Here's a timeline. So in 1983, um, the French discovered the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and they found that if you don't treat HIV, it becomes AIDS. Therefore, we're pretty sure HIV causes AIDS. There are still some people who don't believe this, um, and they're quite active in the media. Um, in another Joe Rogan podcast, isn't the Joe Rogan podcast? So Joe Rogan invited me on his podcast uh, 10 years ago to debate this guy who claims that HIV is not the proximal cause of AIDS. And I was, I was too scared to go on the podcast because Joe Rogan, I, I love this podcast, but he's also a big stoner. And I talked to the communications office at U of, U of O and I said, if I go on this podcast, I, I will probably have to get high with Joe Rogan. And you got to be okay with that. Um, or I could Skype in, right? And I do it you know, completely clear headed and all that stuff, but that's not fun. So what do you want me to do? And they were all about me. Like, yeah, go to LA and be with Joe Rogan and get high, do whatever you need to do. Whatever, get, just get the university's name in the paper. Like, I don't think you thought this through. Right? So, so I said no, and I re I've regretted to this day. I've so regretted to this day because yeah, then he's, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> he got famous and I didn't. So <laughs> but anyway, the point is that um, there are some big names still arguing that HIV is not the cause of, of, of AIDS. And their argument is that it's a combination of other factors, and HIV is actually an opportunistic virus that's along for the ride. So, 95, protease inhibitors, this, this uh, cocktail of antivirals, um, were shown to drastically increase the survival of HIV patients. So, AIDS or HIV suddenly became a chronic disease for a lot of people in the first world. So I mentioned, um, if you want to read about people who deny that connection between HIV and AIDS, you can read about it here. Um, the president of South Africa actually believes that there is no connection, which is problematic. But uh, be aware, there are deniers. So the treatment is a cocktail of drugs. The drugs that we have in wealthy countries are not necessarily the drugs that we have in developing countries. We have a wider selection. 
So if you go to a poor country where we've paid for a program to attack HIV AIDS, we've paid for three or four generic drugs to be there. We have like 13 to 16 drugs to choose from. Why is that important? Because the drugs can be unpleasant. And I've known in many cases where the patients, uh, you know, it's making them nauseous, so they stop taking them for a weekend. When you stop taking it, you can't go back on. They stop working for you. So suddenly you've got to move on to the next drug in line. Right? until you're down to whatever you can handle. If you're in one of these countries where your choices are only one of the three, well, you, you, there is no margin for error. Once you go off of it, you're done. Right? You're going to die probably. So there's a difference in the kinds of treatments available to those of us in, in wealthy nations versus poor nations. The regimens are complicated. Sometimes you need specialized staff. Not just any old nurse can do it. You need a specialized HIV nurse. The side effects can be serious, and the drugs are expensive. So um, they used to be $10,000 a year. Now it's about $100, $200 a year. So the drugs are coming down. Um, this is an old slide. It wasn't last year. It was a few years ago. But there was a big battle a few years ago around the copywriting of HIV drugs and how if we were to maintain intellectual property rights around these drugs, they would remain unaffordable for the majority of people around the world. So there was a massive global movement. Um, there was this thing called TRIPS, Trade with Intellectual Property Rights. This was a movement many years ago to make sure that things that we produce, we retain intellectual rights to. That means they, were t they remain expensive. Um, after much uh, um, uh, bargaining, HIV drugs were deemed to be exempt from these rights, so the price could be kept down. This is a huge deal. Now, you've heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that was recently uh, enacted around the world and shot down by Trump and by Trudeau. Um, that was going to be a global trade agreement that would probably bring back some of these rights again. Please keep aware as young voters of these global issues. How we treat copyright affects the price of drugs around the world. It looks like we're protecting things like who owns the rights to the Avengers movie and whether or not the books I write will continue to make money for my children, but it also affects whether or not poor countries can afford life-saving drugs. Look at the fine print. That's why we keep track of these, um, these trade negotiations so clearly, and that's why it's important they be transparent. With the trans Partnership, a lot of it was done behind closed doors for the express purposes of hiding the fact that drugs prices were going up. Okay, people don't die from AIDS. What do they die from? They die from opportunistic infections. What is an opportunistic infection? It's something that takes the opportunity of a depressed immune system to infect you. What is an opportunistic infection? Well, everything. We all get, op I mean, it's a stupid term because when you get an infection, the infection took the opportunity to infect you. But um, in, in the case of HIV AIDS patients, it's specifically uh, cases where your immune system has been uh, compromised and so uh, you're infected with that thing. So there's a, a moment in medical history in the 80s when the first time uh, Canada and the USA allowed death certificates to put AIDS on the death certificate. Before then, you didn't die from AIDS, you died from pneumonia, tuberculosis, whatever it might be. So it was difficult to keep track of the actual mortality burden of a disease if it never appeared on the death certificate. So this is how the, uh, the labeling of things is important for how we monitor the impact of diseases. So the leading cause of death in AIDS patients is bacterial infection, most commonly tuberculosis. Pneumonia is also quite common. Fungal infections are huge. Uh, I mentioned I used to consult to a drug company owned by Johnson & Johnson, and their entire shtick was making antifungals for AIDS patients. They lost money on it, and they lost money intentionally because that was their marketing wing. They, they rolled out this company in front of media all the time. Look at all, all the great stuff we do for the world. Meanwhile, we're making money elsewhere. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But the point is um, fungal infections are a huge deal. We're aware of it. There is a limited amount of work done on it. Fungal infections are terrifying, by the way. I had a professor once uh, who was a mycologist, and he was called in to consult on a heart uh, transplant patient who's had his immune system artificially suppressed to receive a heart, a new heart, and um, they found a fungal infection on his uh, underarm. So they, they treated it topically, it was fine, and then he died. That's odd. So they did an autopsy. It turns out the fungal infection wasn't on the skin, it was inside and had grown out into the skin. And they treated the skin pride. Cool, huh? So yeah, fungi are fun, hence the fun in fungi. Um, and pneumonia is very common too.
Uh, as I mentioned, the TB HIV AIDS connection is quite profound. Uh, a third of the world has TB to some extent. Uh, and most of them are not active cases, but maybe you know, five to ten percent may become active in the right conditions. Um, and TB accounts for thirteen percent of all AIDS deaths. STDs, very common co-infection with HIV AIDS. Not surprisingly, given that sex workers will often get HIV AIDS and STDs or STIs or VD, whatever you want to call it. Um, the thing is that if you have an STD or STI, you're more likely to get HIV AIDS because of the changes um, to your body in terms of open sores, that kind of thing. Um, and so sex workers are even at greater risk. So we think that there's a five times greater risk for people with STIs to get HIV AIDS if exposed to it. How do we diagnose HIV AIDS? Well, now we have the cheek swab and the blood test. The blood test was very common back in the 70s and 80s. The, the cheek swab showed up in the 90s. If you've never had one, you just get a swab eh, in your mouth, and then you send it back. And, and they're not checking for um, saliva, but this thing called the oral mucosal transudate. In fact, the actual cells of your cheek. That's what they're looking for. There used to be a visual test. So before we developed these clinical tests, the visual test was looking for certain characteristics physiologically. And this was called the Bangui definition, named after the place where the definition was defined. Um, sometimes AIDS was called slim disease because often it was a wasting disease and people were very thin. So this is the characteristics of the Bangui definition. So if you had, I think it's... Um, a total score of, tw of uh, 12, 12 or more, then you, ha you had AIDS according to this definition. So if you're already malnourished, you don't count. If you've got cancer, you don't count. If you're under any kind of immunosuppressive drugs, you don't count. But if these things don't apply to you, we go down the checklist. checklist. Have you lost a lot of weight? Do you have asthenia, which is like narrowing? Do you have um, a lot of fever? Uh, do you have diarrhea? Do you cough? You can probably see that a lot of these things apply to a variety of conditions. So for the longest time, we had a very poor sense of the prevalence of HIV AIDS because the definition was based on these visual characteristics. There's a lot of um, uh, overestimates of the cases. But today we look for things like CD4 counts. So CD4 is a measurement of your immune system. Your CD4 count goes down as the disease progresses. So you want a high CD4 count. High CD4 means your immune system is strong. or you have the viral load. So as the, degrees, the, the disease progresses, your viral load count goes up. So you want low viral load, high CD4. As the disease, the disease progresses, you get a low CD4, high viral load. And one of the things that um, we do in projects around the world, with your tax dollars, thank you very much, is to install CD4 counters and viral load testers in the labs around the world so they can get a proper sense of their true HIV AIDS burden. Okay, let's look at um, a case study of the USA, because USA has pretty good data. And I, I want to look at how the disease differs in wealthy countries like ours versus poor countries. So this, I love this graph. This shows us the um, annual death rates due to leading cause of diseases for this group of people, 25 to 44-year-olds. Why do we care about 25 to 44-year-olds? Why are they so important to us? Yes? That's right. They're economically productive, and they're probably going to reproduce as well. Interestingly, most of you are under that, and I'm over that. So this applies to none of us. That's fantastic. Okay, so if you look at this, um, in 1987, this red thing here is, is AIDS, uh, or death by an HIV AIDS. Uh, it, it wasn't on the radar that much. By the time we got to the 90s, it was the leading cause of economically productive, leading cause of death for economically productive Americans. Isn't that astonishing? Then it went down dramatically in 95, 96. What happened in 95, 96? Yes? Exactly. Those new drugs showed up. So suddenly HIV became a survivable chronic disease. Um, as my, my friend Ed Mills, who's one of the world's leading HIV experts, says, um, we'll get to the point where it's so chronic, you say, oh, my, my age is acting up today. Uh, Got to take a break. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're kind of almost there for some populations. It's so manageable. We've got Magic Johnson, who apparently might be cured, who knows. So that's the path of HIV deaths in North America, where it was a really serious concern, and then the 90s, it became a chronic illness, pretty much. Um, and this is the age distribution over time. It seems to be affecting people, you know, in middle age, not a big deal. And the, the, 
the sex distribution is important. So, in 1987, 90% of cases were male, 10% were female. By the turn of the century, about 80% were male and 20% were female. Okay? It's still largely a male thing in North America. It's largely a gay male thing in North America still. That's really, if I had to summarize the disease according to very simple demographics, that would be the case in North America. Um, and in Canada, HIV incidence has peaked around 84, 87, and much like the U.S., it sort of coming down in the 90s. Uh, same thing here. Same thing here. So around the world, though, we have about 30 million people living with HIV/AIDS. This is data from 10 years ago. It's come down slightly, right? So, but the burden's about the same. Around 30 million is standard. Um, I show this graph in every class because it shows something particular. This is new AIDS cases per year. In North America, it went up. Sorry, North America's here, right? North America, it went down in the 90s, again, due to the cocktail drugs, because HIV was not converting to AIDS. But in the Caribbean, it went up. Why did it go up? Detection bias, exactly. We started looking for it, because the Caribbean did not have a surveillance system until we started making them in the 90s. So it's probably always high. Um, so, remember, in the case of the U.S. and Canada, the deaths started going down in the mid-90s. Globally, the deaths were going up and up and up. Here we are in 2003, and it's peaking. It starts coming down in 2005. Okay. So, it took 10 years later for the global death rate to start coming down after the American death rate came down. Why? Why did it take 10 years? Yes, the back there. Um, I guess it has to do with the intellectual property rights that you were talking about, making the drugs inaccessible to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. So you're you're taking it one step further, and the answer is, of course, the drugs weren't available, and that's one of the reasons that the drugs weren't available. So it's one thing to have the drugs technologically made and known about; it's another to actually get them to the places where they have to get got to. As I mentioned, it's not simply a matter of distribution, it's a matter of cost, it's a matter of getting them into the right hands of people who know how to use them. It's also a nutritional component. Sometimes you need sufficient food to have the drugs work. Um, the drugs require refrigeration. Uh, so transportation, appropriate usage, uh, concomitable uh, uh, nutritional demands as well are slowing down the movement of drugs into the appropriate hands. But 10 years later, the rates are coming down. So this shows us where in the world people are living with HIV AIDS. So Eastern Europe, one and a half million, that's a lot. Uh, North America and Western Europe, about two million. Caribbean, quarter million. Sub-Saharan Africa, 26 million, right? So the vast majority, the overwhelming plurality of HIV AIDS cases are in Sub-Saharan Africa. We thought that India was going to be the next great HIV epidemic. We thought that was going to be it. Didn't happen. And it's unclear why it didn't happen to the extent that it was supposed to have happened. And several things have been suggested. Um, one is it's, it's not as um, uh, sexually as liberated a place as other people would suggest. Yes? Why was it predicted? Um, because of the population density and the lack of condom usage. Um, yeah, those two things essentially. And the fact that you know, sharing of fluids is common in a variety of contexts. And definitely mother to child transmission we thought would be a big deal. So some of the theories that, again, have no evidence base, but they're, they're whispered about amongst you know, big names. I can't believe I'm recording this. Going, I'm going to go on record saying this. Some people suggest that penis size might be a confounder. Uh, yet people have suggested this. So the lar longer penises have a greater propensity for transmitting HIV AIDS, given that if you have an open sore, you're more likely to have access to it. And Indian men have smaller penises, I'm told. Oh, so <laughs> so um, there's that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where to go from that. It's interesting. Um, oh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get back to India in a second because it's a fascinating case. So this is, um, we talk about, yes, madam. Oh, um, yes, but this, the, the arrival of the epidemic was happening before the economic revolution. 
right? So the wealth came late. The wealth came to India late 90s, but HIV AIDS was supposed to arrive early 90s. So the timing doesn't quite work out. But we'll talk about, we'll get back to, the, I did some work on the slums of India on this, and I'll tell you a story in a second because it's, it's kind of funny. Um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, is the uh, the world capital of HIV AIDS. When we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about these countries. So the Sahara is up here. These are countries beneath the Sahara. Um, uh, yeah, just wait, skip that. Thing. So again, skip that too. More looking at the density of HIV AIDS cases, more of the same stuff. I want to talk about women for a second. So as we saw in the case of North America, it's largely a gay male disease still changing somewhat from 90% down to 70% uh, or so. But globally, it seems to be a woman's disease. So this is the percent female cases. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 60% are female. In Eastern Europe, down here, only 30% are female. Global average, 50-50. So globally, it's equally distributed between men and women, but the clustering in the place where it's most of a problem, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, it is largely a female disease. And where does it come from? Well, in Latin America, it seems that commercial sex workers are about you know, 13, 17% of the population. MSM is men who have sex with men. That's about 26%. In South Asia, sex workers are about half. Um, men who have sex with men about 5%. In Central Asia, 6 7%. So in different parts of the world, the pathway to getting it is quite different. And w one of the problems we have programmatically is the funders will require us to dedicate certain amounts of money to certain pathways, regardless of the reality of the situation on the ground. For example, in the Caribbean, intravenous drug use, really not that big a deal. But we need to dedicate a certain amount of money to controlling intravenous drug use. Whereas the biggest problem there is commercial sex, sex work. Right? So that's where the money should be applied, but we have moral... Uh, uh, restrictions on how you can spend the money. So that is politically problematic. So I said MSM is men who have sex with men. Why can't I say gay men? I could say it, but I don't. Why don't I say gay men? Yeah. Not just that, that's true, but what else? Well, the, yeah, so back here. Mm, could, um, not really, no. Stigma is part of it. Yeah. It's because it's culturally, culturally defined, exactly. So gayness is very much a Western idea. But historically and universally, people have sex in ways that transcend identity. So there are men around the world who have sex with other men who would never self-identify as gay. In fact, there are some cases of, of you know, um, homosexual coupling where only the man who does the penetrating or who receives the penetration are considered gay, the other guy's not. Um, we can go on and on talking about this. It's, it's interesting and kind of weird, but that's, that's why we, we never say the word gay. So it's a case where, uh, in India again, um, we're working on getting condoms out into uh, slum areas, and these condoms are branded with a picture of a man and woman saying, you know, you've got to use this if you're going to have sex, prevent HIV AIDS. What people, the message people got from the imagery, because it's largely illiterate population, was you can only get this disease from having sex with women. Therefore, if you want to avoid this disease, have sex with men. So suddenly, straight men or self-identifying straight men were having sex with other straight men unprotectedly to avoid getting HIV AIDS. The exact opposite happened, right? So the branding of your intervention is critical. That was a, it was a classic case of a failed health education policy. So... Um, Sex and sexual identity can be fluid and confusing and culturally defined and definitely heterogeneously distributed around the world. So, um, when we say men have sex with men, this is a sexual relationship between two men. It's not a romantic relationship necessarily. It's not an identity relationship. It's not a social relationship. So we're just very specific. It's just, did you have sex with a man? Truck drivers. So um, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, truck drivers are in fact a kind of disease vector. You can actually visually see the mapping of the spread of disease based on the truck routes. The reason for that is, is that the truck drivers would get serviced by prostitutes in certain areas and spread the disease to different places and bring it back to their village when they sleep with their wives. So um, it became an opportunity for, um, for global health workers to target the disease via this distribution network of drivers. 
It's fascinating. Um, and we expected the same thing to happen in India. It did not really. I think possibly because the same, um, uh, I guess, culture or tradition of commercial sex workers servicing drivers was not as prevalent there. I'm not entirely sure. So, uh, two-thirds of all people with HIV live in sub-Saharan Africa, and that accounts for two-thirds, three-quarters of all AIDS deaths, um, is only 10% of the world population, blah, 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 all the regular stuff. So, the problem is, is that it's eating up a lot of the money there that could be spent on other things. So, it's a crippling disease in sub-Saharan Africa. Some people believe we actually spend too much money on it now. Uh, I spoke to some experts who say that even though we identify that it's a woman's disease and it's a poverty disease, too much money has been spent on female anti-poverty measures in HIV, and we've ignored the men now. I don't know whether to believe that, but recognize there's a debate all the time over these issues. Here's, a, here's an interesting observation. So people with HIV occupy half of all the hospital beds. That means that if you're going to get treatment in a hospital, you've got to be a serious case. You've got to be in the later stages. If you're in the later stages, your chances of you getting better are very, very poor. As a result, the opportunity for us to um, quell the disease is limited by the fact that we're only seeing the ones in the later stages. So it takes a monumental effort, a vertical program, if you will, to show up and actually identify earlier stages in the community and give them appropriate treatment. So you cannot rely on traditional primary care to deal with an epidemic of this nature. Healthcare workers are a challenge because a lot of them are also HIV positive. And the numbers dwindle all the time. Um, you've heard of needle stick injuries, very, very common. So pretty much every nurse or doctor I know has had a needle stick injury. Imagine having one in an AIDS-infested area, giving yourself HIV-AIDS in the process. And if we're going to give out the drugs, the drugs require additional training. Okay, um, I'm going to move fast because I'm running out of time here. So imagine that um, at the household level, if we kill off the wage earners, who tend to be the, the adults, the, the men, end up with impoverished families. You've got the kids then forced into prostitution. This increases disease transmission. And then you've got um, a, a vicious cycle then. So the more AIDS means more poverty. It means the more uh, commercial sex work. It means more AIDS again. We have HIV AIDS eradicating a lot of the anti-poverty measurements that measures that were made since the 50s. Now we're kind of recovering a bit from that and climate change is around the corner that's doubling down on affecting uh, the anti-poverty measurements again. So this is a benighted part of the world that really struggles and cannot get a break. Okay. Um, for the longest time, one of the problems with the HIV AIDS epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa was that we had a lot of child-headed households. So we have entire communities where adults were killed off. So we have a household run by 10-year-olds, 9-year-olds, etc. And basic knowledge is not being passed on. How to plow the fields, the language, the culture, the history, the religion, the mythology are, isn't being passed on. So entire cultures and communities are killed off by this disease. Sometimes there's not enough labor to work the fields. So in these countries, the agriculture output dropped dramatically, um, well, well it's projected drop dramatically due to AIDS taking the workers out of the fields. And this is problematic for a number of reasons, including if you haven't gotten enough food, you cannot get the drugs to work appropriately. Let's talk about the drugs quickly. So um, this is the number of people receiving the drugs in poor countries. So it took a while, but uh, finally, we've got maybe 3 million people getting the appropriate drugs out of 30 million. So 10% are getting the drugs right now. So that's got to improve. As I mentioned, the impact is felt mostly by women. Here is a gay men's disease. In sub-Saharan Africa, it is a woman's disease. And the women also function as caregivers, and now they are the, the uh, sole providers. So um, it is a bit of a crisis. You probably heard of the virgin myth. It's kind of dwindling a bit, but for a while there, there was a myth that the way to cure yourself of HIV AIDS was to have sex with a virgin. And virgins were getting rarer and rarer. That led to an epidemic of child rape in some of these countries. And that led as well to an epidemic of rape of the disabled. So anywhere you can find a virgin. Of course, it's a myth. The virgin myth does not exist. So there is a global movement to re-educate um, many of these populations. You can go to these uh, websites here to learn about it. Again, I think it's, it's, it's quelled somewhat, but it definitely was in the epidemic levels at one point. So these diseases interact with economic forces, 
cultural forces, mythological forces, and are confounded by messaging issues as well, as we saw from that condom example. Circumcision is a new thing. That's not a new thing, but it's a new thing in terms of um, its role in HIV transmission. So actually it was a, a, a scientist here at UOttawa who, who was part of the team to figure out that male circumcision actually can reduce the transmission of disease. It's unclear to me whether it means transmitting it to women or getting it from women. Um, but as a result, there's now a movement to really encourage circumcision in highly endemic areas, hence license plate. Ow, 65. Good times. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, there are entire families without caregivers. So we have a couple of lost generations, AIDS orphans. So the numbers are large and they're growing. Um, these are kids with no education, no guidance from adults, poor socialization, not a lot of acculturation, um, and they are proving to be an enormous economic underclass. And they tend to swell the ranks of child soldier armies, uh, prostitution armies, those kinds of things. Um, debt is the last thing I'll talk about. So I mentioned debt a couple of times, and a lot of these poor com uh, countries are stricken with debts that are hangovers from the colonial era. The example is Kenya. So Kenya pays 17 times more on debt repayment than it does on HIV control. If it was relieved of that debt burden, it could probably spend that money on controlling its HIV epidemic. And if you look at this graph, it shows um, there is the more HIV prevalence there is, the less likely you are going to have economic growth. So clearly there's a relationship between having an AIDS burden and having the ability to pay off your debts. So it is in our best interest to relieve these nations of their debt burdens so that they, they can kill off their HIV burdens and therefore retain some degree of economic wealth. Okay, I want to ask you a question. If we made the retrovirals dirt cheap, would that solve the problem? I mentioned that we have a problem getting the drugs, right? Um, it took 10 years for uh, the world to get the drugs where we got them in 95. But if we made them dirt cheap, that's all a problem? No, it wouldn't. Because the problem isn't gated by price, it's gated by other factors. So Bill Clinton says, the majority of HIV positive people don't even know they have the disease. So there's a problem of testing. We haven't gotten enough testing around the world. I've been to countries where people find out they have HIV when they go to emigrate to the US or Canada, and they're tested by the embassy. So they're told about the HIV status by a secretary in the Canadian embassy. It's a horrible way to find out. So um, you don't know unless you're tested, and there's no testing. Second of all, we don't have the training of individuals. So there's a problem in um, healthcare worker quality. So it's one thing to have the drugs. It's another to actually have people to actually give the drugs. Then we have transportation issues, um, storage issues, etc. I will stop there as I talk at breakneck speeds. Thank you very much. See you Thursday.